purpose of this lesson is to learn about modules, assignments and arithmetic operators, incrementing and decrementing variable values, and also about post and prefix incrementing and decrementing. In C Sharp, all of the stuff that we do is written in what are called modules, and a module is nothing more than an assembly of uh, code that's written in a particular language that's going to be different types of files that are making up our program. The nice thing is, is that I can write my modules in C Sharp, C++, Visual Basic, or any other programming language that's supported by the .NET framework. And then what happens is they can all talk together, which means that if I am writing part of my program and somebody else is writing part of the program, I could use C Sharp, they could use C++, somebody else could be using Visual Basic, and we actually all could interact with each other because they are all .NET Framework applications. When we're writing our programs, we're going to start using assignment operators, and an assignment operator is just simply the equal sign, so we're going to set something equal to something else. Now what this is used for is to assign a value to a variable location. We talked about variables before that a variable is just simply a named space in memory and then we can reference that space by name but we can also update that space so we can put a new value into that space. We can read things that are there and the way that this works is there's a specific order which is I'm going to set something equal to something else and what I'm going to do is whatever memory location I want to change will go on the left side of the equal sign and then whatever I want to do to that memory location will go on the right side of the equal sign and the the stuff that's on the right side of the equal sign it could be things like uh, calculation it could just simply be setting it to a literal but whatever I want to manipulate goes on the left whatever I want to do to it goes on the right and we'll get more into that here in just a minute we can also do arithmetic on our on our value. So what we could do is we could take two numbers and add those together or we could subtract two numbers. So you see here we have the addition is just simply a plus sign, subtraction is a minus sign, the asterisk is for multiplication, the forward slash that's the one on the key with a question mark on the keyboard that is to use to, uh, to divide two numbers and then we have the percent sign is used for this thing called a modulus. Now if you think back to elementary school you used to have to do things like uh, 10 divided by 3 and we would write something like 3R1 because we wanted to know what the remainder was. Well, that remainder is technically called the modulus. So if I were to do something like 10 divided by 3, I would get 3R1. But if I were to do something like 10 modulus 3, the answer is just simply 1. The modul modulus is just simply what is the remainder when you divide two numbers. We can overload some of these operators, which means we can give them additional functionality. We'll talk, to, talk about that in future lessons. All right, so if I have a variable and I want to increase or decrease its value, I can do that. To increase a value is called incrementing, and to decrease a value is called decrementing. Typically, we're going to decrement or increment things by 1. So let's say I have a variable location, and the variable location is called x, and x has a value in it right now. So let's say maybe it's 10. All right, so what I'm going to do is on the left side, this is the value that I want to manipulate, and the right side is the stuff that I want to do with it. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell, look and see what x is. So x is 10 right now. Add 1 to it, and then put whatever this result is back over here in x. So if x is 10 right now, then we're going to say 10 plus 1 is 11, and then we're going to take that 11 and stick it into the x. So that's incrementing by 1. All right. Conversely, if we take x minus 1, so if x is 10 again, then we do 10 minus 1 is 9, and then take that value and put it into x on the left side. So we can increment like this, or we can decrement like this. There are other ways to do it, though. We have shortcut notation, and C sharp makes it real quick to add and subtract things and it gets a little less confusing when you get used to using this notation because instead of writing x equals x plus 1 what I can do is something like x plus equals 1 and the way that you need to look at this is going to be x is equal to x plus 1 and it means the exact same thing both of these mean the same thing but the difference is this one down here you notice x is only referenced one time it does two things. One is it makes it a little bit shorter for me to type, but it also causes the system to save a little bit of resources when performing this calculation. 
because what it's going to do is it doesn't have to go and do a lookup for x first. It just simply says, hey, take one and add it to whatever's at the x location. All right, so then we can also go the other way. We can say x equals x minus 1. Well, this is going to be x minus equals 1. So x equals x minus 1. It's the same thing, but it's just shortcut notation. But then what we can do with this is we can use it for more complex operations. So later on we could do something like x plus equals and then convert something to a number from a text box. And we'll get more into this when we actually start playing with GUI interfaces. But it makes it real easy to add things together and to be able to increment values and decrement values. Now this right here, this x equals x plus 1 and x equals x minus 1, these are the most frequently used incrementing and decrementing operations. So in our code we'll see a lot of times we'll see x plus equals 1 and we'll see x minus equals 1 or we'll see x equals x plus 1 or x equals x minus 1. Those are really common. Well C sharp actually has some shortcut operators for us. Alright so what we can do is we can use this thing called post incrementing or post decrementing. And so instead of saying x equals x plus 1 we can say x plus equals 1 like I showed you in that last slide or we could just simply say x plus plus. And if I do this x plus plus, all three of these mean exactly the same thing. They're all the same. All right, conversely, if I have x equals x minus 1, I can say x minus equals 1. Okay, that means the same thing. Or I could do x minus minus. So all three of these mean the exact same thing. Now the reason that I'm going to type this shortcut is because in my code, a lot of times I'm going to do things like counters. And when I have a counter, what I'm doing is simply incrementing by 1 over and over and over again. And what this will do for me is it makes my code a little bit shorter, makes it easier for me to read, and makes it easier for me to troubleshoot. It performs the exact same operation, but it also requires less computational cycles to actually perform. All right, we can also do what's called a prefix incrementing and decrementing. Now this is the same thing. I have plus plus k and minus minus, I'm sorry, plus plus x and minus minus x, they perform the same thing, but there is a little bit of a difference. The difference is, I'm going to assume that x is equal to 10. All right, so for our, uh, our prefix increment, what we're going to do is x is 10, so we have 10 here, we're going to add 1 to it. So what we're going to do is we're going to say add 1 to 10, um, to 10 so now we get 11. And then what, when you perform this calculation over here, when we add 1 to 10 and get 11, then we're going to take that value and put it in the J. So now both J and X are both 11. But if I do it the other way around, if I say J equals X plus plus, now this is a little bit different. What this one is, is this post increment, it's going to take whatever the value of X is, put it into J, and then it will add 1 to X. So what would happen is you would put the value of 10 into j, so now j is 10, x is 10, add 1 to x, so now x is 11, and then we're done. So now what you end up with when you're done is j is equal to 10 and x is equal to 11. So we have to be careful when we do our prefix and postfix incrementing and decrementing. Sometimes we'll get unexpected responses out of it because we'll end up with one number higher or lower than what we really expected. And it's just simply because we used the wrong one. So you have to be real careful. I'm going to start using some real life examples to demonstrate these to you. And so what I'm going to do is build my first Visual Studio application. And I'm going to start with a new project. And make sure that you have C Sharp selected over here. The reason for it is, is it will automatically default to Visual Basic. And when you start designing your applications, everything looks the same until you go to run it. And then what will happen is it will it'll come up and it will just simply have the wrong code or the wrong uh, type of elements. And you'll spend some time building your program only to find out that it doesn't work. All right, so I want a Visual C Sharp, Windows, and then I'm going to make a console application. All right, now the way that this works is down here at the bottom it says name, and this is console application 1. And what it will do is by default, under my documents, it will actually create a folder with this name. And it will contain all of the resources that are required for my project. It's actually called a solution folder. And what it does is it takes everything that's required to make my program run and all the testing and all the debugging stuff and it all gets stored in that one folder. 
All right, so I'm going to call this Hello World. And it will allow you to use spaces, but I would strongly suggest getting in the habit of not using spaces. If you must use a space, put an underscore. Uh, but it's going to create the directory for the solution. Click OK. It takes about a, a couple seconds for it to come up, and it will populate that entire folder for me. So what I can do is I can go and look and see the stuff that's in that folder. So if I look, I'm under Documents, and then Visual Studio 2012. If I go to Projects, I will now have a list of all the projects that I've created. Here's my Hello World. You will notice I have a file called a solution file here. And if I open this up, I'm going to open it with Notepad++. No, I don't want the update. Um, but what it is, is it's a listing of the stuff that makes up my solution file. So this is what we would actually use to open it. Think of this kind of like a shortcut to open my, my solution. It knows where to find the file. So it knows the name of the project. It knows the name of it. And then it also has some things that it sets up to identify it to the system. So make sure that you, you understand this .sln file is nothing more than just really a shortcut to open the rest of the stuff that you need. What we actually need is under Hello World folder, and here are our program files that make up the actual program. So this is our program.cs. This is our, our actual file. When I look in Visual Studio, this is what I'm actually looking at right now is this. So this and this are exactly the same because that is the same file. You'll notice this is program.cs. I can edit any of these any, any of these files with a text editor because everything that we do in Visual Studio is nothing more than text files. All right, so I'm going to start making my first program. You'll notice I have some, some lines of code up here. They all say using system, using so forth else. What these are, these using commands tell the, the system to import resources that are in other sections of code. What happens is by default I would have to manually type the code out for what a button would look like and what a form would look like and what a um, text box would look like and everything else. But the system already has that stuff to define for it so what we can do is we can tell it to use these other resources so we can take advantage of things that are already, that are already created for us. The next thing here is our namespace. Remember we talked about the namespace is just simply the name of the um, entire block of memory that's used for my application, just to give it a name. We have a class, which the class here is called program. The class name can change. You'll notice the program is the name of our program over here. And then we have this thing here called static void main. This is our main method. Any program always starts at the main method. So the very first thing that runs in my code in any program will always run at the main method. Now can I rename this? Yes, there is a way to rename it. I can't do it directly here. I'd actually have to go through and edit some text files to do it. I could rename this to something else if I wanted to, but typically we're going to leave it as main, and main is going to be the very first thing that runs in our program. So what I want to do is I want to add some code to my program, and my code is going to go right here under main. Now remember, like I said, this is a console application, which means it's going to bring up something that looks like the command prompt. It's not going to bring up the pretty GUI interface like we're used to seeing for Windows, but the point of this is to be able to show you, one, how to make a, an application real quickly. Sometimes you need an app just to do a quick task, and it's going to take a lot longer to design a pretty application versus a console application. But really the purpose of this is just to teach you the basics, show you how it works, and then get you to understand how these variables and uh, arithmetic operators function. Okay, so the first thing that we want to play with is this thing called the console. Now my program has nothing right now. If I go ahead and start my program, this is my debugging. You'll notice it says debug up here. So when I debug it, what it's actually going to do is it's going to build an executable based on the code that I have here in my program. So if I start this, it flashed up on the screen for a second it had a console that popped up. All right, now the problem is is that my program popped up on the screen and then disappeared real fast because it, there was nothing for it to do. It will automatically exit when it's done. All right, so I want to display something on the screen. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to force it to wait a second. I want it to make me press enter before it'll do anything. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to type a console 
dot read. And for the time being, this is gonna be the very last line that I have in all of my code, because what I'm gonna do by this, this console.read is gonna tell the system, wait for me to press enter before it does anything else. So now if I click start, now I get a text box that pops up and it's waiting for me to press enter. And as soon as I press enter, it's done. So this, this line of code tells the system to pause, just wait a second. And the reason I'm doing this is because I want you to be able to see what's going on on the screen. All right, so we can read things from the console and we can write things to the console. All right, so the very first thing I wanna do is I'm gonna do a console.write line. Now what this will do is write something out to the screen. And a write line is a method that takes an argument, which means that I need to put some stuff inside of a parentheses here. And so what I'm going to do is I'm gonna type hello world inside of the parentheses. Now that's a text string, so I have to put it inside of quotes. So what's gonna happen is the system is gonna take the text string, hello world, send it over to the right line method, and then it will display it to the screen. So now if I start this, I now have hello world. And once again, it's sitting here waiting for me because I put that console.read. If I were to get rid of this console.read here and then run this, it flashed up on the screen and went away and I couldn't actually see what it's doing. So what I want you to do is for all of your programs, just put console.read for now at the end for any of these console-based applications. That way it'll stay up on the screen and you can actually see the results of your program. I want to put a second line of text. I'm gonna say console.write line. Uh, how are you today? Okay, so now what this will do, this right line will display hello world and then put a line break. And then it'll say, how are you today? And put another line break. So when I start this, you'll see I end up with two lines of text. There is another command that's not line, it's just simply write. And what write does is it does not make a line break. So what will happen is it will take those two strings and put those together on one line. Now you'll notice that after my how are you today, because that one is right line, it did make a line break and the cursor is on the next line. So right and right line are gonna be our first ways of getting things on the screen so you can see the output for all of these commands that we're gonna be typing. All right, so we're gonna play with some variables. And so the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to make a new variable, which is, um, it's gonna be a string and so what, what I have to do is every time I make a variable, I have to declare its data type, and then I have to give it a name. And so this is going to be um, my feelings. Okay, so what I'm doing is I'm declaring that I have a string called my feeling, and I'm gonna set it equal to happy. Okay, so now what this does is it's underlining my feeling and it's saying that it's assigned but it's never used. So essentially what that means is you have a variable that is sitting here, it has a value, it's tying up memory, but nobody's ever using it. So we'll actually let you know. And then what I wanna do is I wanna display it to the screen how I'm feeling. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say console dot right line. And then what I'm going to do is instead of putting a text string of happy, I wanna display my feeling. All right, so now what it will do is it'll take whatever's in happy, I'm sorry, whatever's in my feeling, which is happy, and it will substitute it here, and it will display this out to the screen. All right, so that's taking a variable and displaying it to the screen. Now I can do some other things, like I could concatenate, which means to put two text strings together. I can use the plus sign and concatenate two things. So I could do something like um, today, I am feeling, and then what I'm gonna do is put a plus sign. Now this is the way that most programming languages allow you to concatenate strings. And what this means is I'm gonna take today I am feeling, and then I put an extra little space here, and then my feeling, and then it will display today I am feeling happy. All right, now I want to uh, add an extra uh, period at the end of it, so I'm gonna concatenate a period at the end, and we're gonna make it look a little nicer today, I'm feeling happy, period. Well, what happens is in most of our programming languages, this is how we actually put text strings together. In C-sharp, we actually have this thing called um, string substitution. 
that allows me to do this a little bit differently. All right, so what I'm going to do is today I am feeling, and then I'm going to replace this with a curly bracket and then a zero, period. Okay, and then so what this does is it tells it to look at our first item that exists in this list over here. So if I do this, my feeling, what it's going to do is take my feeling, whatever's here, and substitute it in for zero. So it'll do the exact same thing, but it actually gives us a much cleaner section of code because it makes it easier for me to figure out how to do my spacing and my punctuation and everything. So I get the same thing. Today I'm feeling happy. Um, so I'm going to add a couple of things. So so we're going to make a new variable called teacher, or called my work, which is teacher. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to say today I am feeling, and then zero is my feeling. But I'm going to add to this. I am a, and then what I'm going to do is my next item is going to be one. All right, so then what I'm going to do is over here at the end, I'm going to put a comma and then my work. Okay, so what this does is it tells it, okay, here's my string where you see this zero, substitute the first word or the first value. Where you see this one, substitute the second value. So when I run this, I get something today I'm feeling happy, I am a teacher. All right, so what this does is it makes it real easy for me to be able to substitute text strings in for whatever's going to display out on the screen. And we're going to use this to try to go through our arithmetic operators and make it a little bit easier to see what they're doing. Now the thing is I can reuse these variables in another character su or string substitution. So I'll do something like tomorrow I will be okay so now what's going to happen is I get a new list here so I start over with zero again. So even though I'm going to use the same variable again, because this is a new string, then I'm going to start it with a zero because this is a new list. So I get, I can use happy more than once, but we're just simply going to make it where in our list here we have zero, one, our next one will be two, and so forth. In C sharp, our lists always start with zero. Zero is our first counting number. So we want to make sure we always start at zero. And so this would be item zero here, this is item one, and then this is a new list, so this is item zero here. All right, so I want to make some other types of variables and then do some calculations with them. All right, I'm gonna make an integer value, and I'm gonna call it uh, num days. There are seven days in a week. And then I'm gonna make another variable, which is int, which is num weeks. So maybe the number of weeks in a month. And so there are four weeks in a month, usually. And then I'm gonna do something like int, um, let's call this num weeks per month. Makes it a little bit more descriptive. And I guess we should also say num days per week. And then num weeks per year. 52 weeks per year, and then we'll do something like int uh, num days per uh, year. Okay, now my variables here, <clears throat> I'm naming these improperly, and I want to show you something. What I'm going to do is I'm going to start prefixing my variable names with the data type. And the reason for it is, is when we start writing our code out there, um, C Sharp has this thing built into it called IntelliSense. Sorry, Visual Studio has this thing built into it called IntelliSense that will actually make it easier for me to locate my variables and my other elements. So this is going to be kind of redundant, but I'm going to put the same data type here. So I'm making a new data type element, that, which is an integer, that is called int num days per week. And like I said, this just simply is used so that later on when we start typing things out on the screen, it will find these for us. It makes it much easier for us to try to figure out what we call our variables. And then also once we see them, we know what their um, int number days per year. Okay, so we know that their data type is correct. So num weeks per year, days per year. Why is it underlined? Okay, 
there. So what it was doing is just automatically trying to rename it to match the other ones up there. But the little red thing that was underneath showed there was an error, and I was trying to figure out what the error was. All right, so what I'm going to do is I want to figure out approximately how many days there are per month. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to display out to the screen that there are so many days per month. All right, so what we're going to do is I'm going to do a console.writeline. And then we'll say something like there are uh, so many, and we're going to use our character substitution here. I'm sorry, a string substitution, and then days per month. Okay, so the question is, where does this come from? Well, the zero is going to be whatever this first thing is over here. And so what we can do is we can do calculations. So I could put int num days per week, and I could put int num weeks per month. All right, so what I want to do is I want to perform a calculation. All right, so I'm going to make another variable. It's an integer data type. And we're going to call it imp, uh, num days per month. Okay, now I'm not actually giving it a value, so I'm going to end it here. And remember, every one of our statements ends in a semicolon. This is assigning a value. This is not. So this just simply creates the memory location, but it doesn't actually assign an initial value. But what I want to do now is I'm going to say int num. And if you notice, when I started typing, watch this, type int num. And here are all of the variable names that start with int num, and they show up in the list here. Makes it real easy for me to figure out which ones I need. So if I go down through the list here, int num days per month, that's the one that I want. And that's going to be equal to int num days per week times int num weeks per month. Okay, so now what I can do down here is I can say something like uh, there are, you know, whatever zero is, that's going to be our int num days per month. So that's int num days per month. And then we'll display that out to the screen. Now you'll see these are green. They're saying that they're unused. The program will still compile. It just will show an error message that we haven't used them. So let's go ahead and start this. And we actually got it to do the calculation for us. So the way that it works is it takes whatever the number is in int num days per week, which is 7, times int num, day, uh, int num weeks per month, which is 4. 7 times 4 is 28. It took 28 and put it into int num days per month. And then the 28 here would get displayed for the character substitution over here. So we actually end up with there are 28 days per month. So what this is doing is it's allowing me to perform an arithmetic calculation on a variable. So, But what it's doing is it's taking the value from that variable to perform the calculation and then stick that into another variable. Now I can shorten this a little bit. Um, what I can do is I don't have to declare this variable and then use it in another line. I could do something like this. I'm going to get rid of this line of code and I could actually declare it here. So the declaration for this could actually be that we want to perform the calculation and I will end up with the exact same thing. So that will allow me to shorten my code just a little bit. I have a new variable, I want to declare it, and then I want to perform a calculation while I declare it and then I initialize it. So it allows us to do a lot of stuff to make things shorter, but we can use these longer variable names which makes it more descriptive. Now when we use these really long variable names and we make them really descriptive, this is called uh, self-commenting or self-documenting. So essentially what that means is that if I look at this code, I can say, okay, well, there, the number of days per week times the number of weeks per month is the number of days per month. I can look at this code real quick and I can see what exactly the program is doing. It makes it real easy to go back through and troubleshoot if I use descriptive variable names. All right, so we can go a little bit further if we want to. Uh, we could take this and say there are, let's say approximately, 28 days per month. And, and then I'm going to use number one because this is going to be the next item in our list. Um, weeks per year. And, and then now I'm going to use the number two because now it's the next item in our list. 
um, days per year. Okay, so now what this is doing is make it real easy for me to type out. But um, when I type these lines here, and now I need to include things. So I have 0, 1, and 2, which means I have three items, but I only have one that's listed here. Okay, so our second one is weeks per year. Per year. So this is going to be int num weeks per year. And then this one is the days per year, so that's the int num days per year. All right, so now what I can do is when I run this, now it will give me there are approximately 20 days per month, 52 weeks per year, and 365 days per year. So it allows me to substitute values in, and then all I have to do is just simply give it some sort of place to hold the value in our text string, and then the system will automatically substitute them for us. Let's say I don't want this line of code. I don't want to have to calculate this here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to comment this out. And by commenting out, what I mean is I'm going to put a forward slash forward slash, and you'll notice it turns green. That means that this section of code is not going to be used anymore. All right, so the system ignores it. It's still there for our purpose, but the system will not do anything with it. And what I want to do is I want to take this little section of code here, the num days per week and uh, num weeks per month, and I'm going to replace this down here with that. And what I can do is I can actually perform a calculation and perform a substitution without having to put it into a variable. So I can do this. I could, if I wanted to, I could say here uh, 4 times 7. And it will let me do this. So whatever I put in for this little section here between the commas will automatically get substituted for its placeholder over here. So I can have a calculation, I can have a variable, I can have a text string, I can have what's called a literal, and it will automatically substitute any of those in for whatever is here. All right, I want to show you some other data types. All right, so so far I played with integers, with which an integer is just simply a whole number. Usually we'll play with other things like uh, doubles or floats or characters. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a new character value. And a character gets prefixed with um, chr. And then this is going to be my letter, whatever it is. And we're going to put this as an a. Now a, a text string gets double quotes around it. A character gets a single quote. So my character for letter is, oops, I put a comma. Uh, it's supposed to be semicolon. Um, is an A, but like I said, the the characters get single quotes around them. All right, I have strings, which will get prefixed with str, um, my name, and we'll set that equal to Brian. I have some other data types I can play with. I have uh, what's a double, and a double is going to be uh, dbl, and this would be something like um, total cost maybe something cost amount equals ten dollars and sixty cents I have um, what are called floats and so this would be FLT um, sales amount and this is eleven dollars and seventy seven cents now the catch with the float is at the end of this number I have to put the capital letter F and what that's doing is telling the system that this is a float. Because what will happen, it gets confused between doubles and floats. But if I put an F here, it will automatically know that this number is a float, even though I've declared it as a float over here. So floats get a little bit confusing because we have to put those Fs in there. Uh, we have other types that we can play with, like we have decimal amounts. So these are typically used for money. And so this would be like a DEC um, commission. And this would be something like $250.56. Now this one's a little bit different. The F or the float got an F. Our decimal gets an M for money. And then let's see, we also have um, let's see, we have string, we have double, we have float, decimal, character, 
and then integer is our other one that we typically use. So int um, my age, and then you can assign that a value. So you can assign a value to it, and it's a whole number. So the catch is going to be the characters, individual characters get single quotes. A string gets double quotes. A double is going to be a decimal value. A float is also a decimal value, but gets an F after it. A decimal is a decimal value and gets an M after it. And think of it as money because typically we use the decimal for money. And then integer is going to be a whole number and we just assign some whole number to it. All right, I want to perform some arithmetic calculations on these. So I'm going to get rid of our strings. We don't need those. And let's call this um, quantity. Okay, so we're hit, we're talking about costs here for things, and we have quantity for things. All right, so what I want to do is I want to uh, display on the screen the output of adding some of these things together. So I'm going to do something like console dot right line, and then we're going to say dbl total cost plus um, FLT sales amount. Okay, so we're just simply going to take those two values and add those together and display those to the screen. Now, if I look at this 10.6 and then 11.77, this should be uh, 22.37. All right, so if I run this, I do get something like that. Okay, so now I'm going to take this DBL total cost and I'm going to add Actually, I'm going to keep doing the same line here. So instead of float sales amount, let's do our decimal commission rate. Let's see, desk commission is what we call it. All right, so run this. And we get an error when we try to run this. And the problem is, is that we're taking a double amount, which is a decimal amount. We're taking a decimal amount, and we're trying to add these two together. And if I hover over this, you'll see the operator plus cannot be applied to operands of type double and decimal. What's happening is the plus sign in the right line method is actually used to concatenate these two strings together. It's designed to take these two things, make them strings, and then put them together. And the problem is, is that it can't do it because it doesn't know how to elevate these things. It doesn't know how to take a double and a decimal and put them together. So what I need to do is I need to tell the system to take this decimal value here and treat it as if it were a double. And the way that I'm going to do that is before the, the variable name, I'm going to put a set of parentheses. I'm going to type the word double and then close the parentheses. And so what I'm doing is I'm telling the system, hey, this thing that's a decimal here, I want you to treat it as if it were a double. And this is called explicit casting. I'm telling the system, cast this thing, treat it just like it were a double, and then add it to DBL total cost. And then when I run this, now it will let me run it. So there are certain data types that cannot automatically be added or other arithmetic operators be enacted upon them without us actually telling it. Now when we did the double and the float, those two worked okay because the system knows to automatically make a float and into a double. But if the system doesn't know to automatically do it, then we have to explicitly cast it and tell the system to elevate this thing to another data type. And I would get the same thing if I tried to multiply the float and the integer, or if I take the decimal and the integer. So what I have to do is if I get an error when I try to perform a calculation on two different types of data, I have to specifically cast them and tell the system which one to treat them as. In this lesson, you learn that modules are the different types of code that can be used from different .NET framework systems that can actually be used together in one project. Those are typically going to be separate files. You learn about the assignment and arithmetic operators, the equal sign, plus, minus, division, multiplication, and modulus. You learn about post and prefix incrementing and decrementing and the differences and what also would happen if you use post versus pre. Sometimes we can end up with different values than we expect. 
You learned about string substitution, which is using a placeholder to display output on the screen. You learned about concatenation, which is taking two text strings and putting them side by side from each other. We use the plus sign to do that. And also the explicit casting, which is to tell the system what data type to use when trying to perform arithmetic operations on two different uh, data type variables that we're using.